So, Marcus, have you put competitions behind you now forever? Um, maybe not forever, but certainly for the time being. I think uh, one Wigmore song competition is enough for anybody, really. Did that take over your life when you were doing it? Uh, certainly. It took over the, the summer preceding that September. Um, it, it really did dominate those the couple of months running up to it. Memorising, buffing, honing? Mm, exactly. And, and making sure that these programmes really felt just organic, actually. Yeah. And in your body as well. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was very important, particularly... Um, I think for the for the final program, actually, when when you actually got to do a half hour, um, it really needed to feel a very comfortable half hour. So, did you run that through as a program in public? Did you have the chance to? Um, we didn't actually have the chance to do it in public, um, but we I did do it to my my coach, my teacher, my various people. Your dog, academy. your grandma. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's the only way. Yep. And what effect has winning the competition had on your career now? Um, well, effectively, it has sort of just moved me up several notches, I'd say. Um, it's really sort of moved me into it, into the professional sphere slightly earlier than, than I expected to, to be moving into that, that, that sort of area. So it's been fantastic, really. Um, I think one of the biggest um, pluses that it's been has actually been introducing me to um, a number of agents who sort of came to that competition, uh, one of which I've now, I've now signed, signed with, so it's been Well, great. it's a wonderful shop window, win or lose. Mm. I mean, we've been talking about this with uh, some of our other guests, and uh, one of the things that strikes me about the competition is that it isn't winner-take-all, and that it's an opportunity for everyone to be heard on, on a level playing field, if I can mix a metaphor. Mm. Exactly, and I think that was part of the reason why it was such a positive competition experience. Uh, for me and for Libby, who was playing, it was uh, it was just such a privilege even to have fifteen minutes in the hall. We were so pleased just to be in that first public round uh, that everything after that was really a bonus. You're a veteran now in uh, in Wigmore Hall, Marcus. You've sung here loads since the the competition. Do you have any advice for people coming to do the next competition as to um, particular facets of the hall? Well, really, it's it's about just choosing repertoire that suits you because the hall is just the best place to sing, really. Um, and I think I've heard so many different voices here over the years when I've come to concerts, and I've never heard a voice that doesn't work in this hall. It's just such a perfect acoustic. Um, so it's really just about picking a programme that suits you, and the hall will show off the best facets of your voice, I think. Any thoughts on picking that programme? Any, <clears throat> any, any uh, rules of thumb? The Farnsworth method? <laughs> well, the, th the Farnsworth method when it comes to competitions is actually steering clear of themes uh, because I think with the various um, uh, stipulations that the competition put in place, it's quite difficult to come up with a, maybe a themed programme for your final when you've got to fit in three yeah. languages. Yeah. Um, it's not impossible to do that, but I think it's, it's just more important to, to put together a repertoire that you're really, really comfortable with and to make sure you've got enough musical contrast in there, really. Yeah. Not all gloom and doom. Uh, no, which can be quite tempting, I think, because there's so much great, depressing music. Oh, well, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> most of the great songs are gloomy and doomy. Yes, yeah, exactly. And I, I think certainly in, in our final programme, we, we did work in a couple of um, lighter numbers, shall we say, which did go down a treat. And it, it also just served to break up some of those really great, sort of heavy masterpieces. Yeah. yeah. You don't want a meal of just fillet steak. And exactly. Yeah. <laughs> don't feel that you need to be absolutely straight-jacketed into you know, the whole suit and tie thing. I think it's about just performing in something that's comfortable for you. Uh, I was actually told off once for wearing a tie in a recital because I was told that I was a quite a relaxed person in life and that people wanted to see that on stage as well. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not something that you need to feel is really an issue. I think just, you know, look smart and make sure you're comfortable. Don't stick to a program that's entirely obscure uh, because I think you're making life very, very hard for yourself. Um, there's a lot of obscure repertoire um, which is undiscovered which should be heard more often. But there's a lot of it that's undiscovered for a very good reason. Uh, and I think it's nice to have a mixture of those really well-known songs and um, some less well-known. So you're also saying 
don't just pick yeah. the, the chestnuts. Also, don't just pick those great yeah. songs. Apart from anything else, you're making life very hard for yourself. Um, I think you need to think very carefully before doing something like The Ale King. Um, it's done so much and has been done so well by so many different people. Um, you really have to, got to have something very special to say about a song like that if you're going to do it yeah. in this sort of forum. Don't use gesture to make a point in a song. Um, do use it maybe to, to back something up, but it has to be thought first. I think too much gesture really can obscure um, what is going on in a song and can actually just detract again from what is going on in your face. I think it's so important for, uh, for, for your eyes and for your face to be the most expressive part of you physically um, and let the voice do what it needs to do. Um, and actually in terms of gesture, I also don't want to see people absolutely fixed to one spot with their arms stuck to the sides or in front of them or whatever. Um, it's about just being relaxed and I think if the thought is generated in the right way internally, then gesture sort of takes care of itself, actually. Would you like to come and say that to my Guildhall students? <laughs> Excellent answer, Mr. F. Do have a system for what you do before a performance. I think it's really, really good to have a routine of some kind, um, particularly when you're put into this kind of extra pressurised situation, because obviously in a concert situation, you know that the punters are paying and they want you to do a good job. And the jury want you to do a good job too, but they're also going to be listening. They've got their red pants. Yeah, absolutely. And with that at the back of your mind, it is going to make you nervous. So what's your routine, Mark? Um, I tend to have as much sort of quiet time before I sing as possible. Um, if I've got time to kill, in a, either in a, for a, before a competition or, or before a concert, I like to try and make sure I'm in a room with a piano um, because I can sit down and play and just mess around basically and play some jazz and do something that takes my mind off singing. But then for about the half hour before I sing, I just try and be quiet and I focus on my program and I think about, you know, certainly about what I'm going to start with, but also what comes after that. I think it's quite important not just to focus on that on that first song. Uh, otherwise you might fall short. <laughs> well, I think we should ask Mr. Gilhooly if we can hear you play jazz sometime. <laughs> I'm not sure that's a very good idea. That would add something to the song recital. <laughs>